Okay, we're going to cover some odds and ends from our blood system uh, lesson last time. All right, our components revisited, keeping in mind this is a peripheral blood smear, so you take it out of your vein in your arm and you can see a lot of different things under the microscope. You've got those uh, donut-shaped uh, red blood cells or erythrocytes. You've got those five different kinds of white blood cells. You've got the tiny little platelets that are dotted around the place and everything here is suspended in that plasma. All right, so you can see a nice cartoon version of that. Right, gas transport is really important and it's the only role of the red blood cell to transport gas. Now we all often think about uh, just the oxygen, but we've got to remember that the carbon dioxide is also being picked up um, from all around the different cells, all the different cell types. Once they've completed their cellular respiration, one of those byproducts is carbon dioxide and the body needs to uh, expel it, right? So it needs to travel back to the lungs to be expelled. And once the oxygen is picked up in the lungs, it will be delivered to the cells and round and round it goes. So we have to keep thinking about oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now, hemoglobin in the red blood cells is a four subunit protein. And each one of these subproteins has a heme molecule, sorry, the heme molecule has an iron atom in it, right? So each of these four has a piece of iron in it, right? We need to keep thinking about, hey, if you are um, iron deficient, this is why if you are iron deficient, the hemoglobin will not form properly and therefore you will not be able to circulate the gas appropriately. So here's just another depiction of it, same thing. And we've got our oxyhemoglobin. We can see that the oxygen is going to bind here and deoxyhemoglobin when the oxygen is not bound. Gas exchange happens in the lungs. Now this is really zoomed in in one of those tiny little air sacs in the lungs. We've seen them when we've done dissections and when we um, have seen live, fresh, sorry, fresh lung tissue. That's the alveolus. So the tiny little air sac where the oxygen is going to come in, it's going to diffuse across into that one tiny little stream, right, into that tiny little blood vessel and it's going to attach onto the hemoglobin in the red blood cells and at the same time over here the carbon dioxide is being offloaded ready to be expelled. Now hemoglobin is really important and the difference here is we've got adult hemoglobin as you grow older and you have adult hemoglobin, even babies have adult hemoglobin, but this fetal hemoglobin is a different type of hemoglobin that babies or fetuses will have in the womb. It is different because it has different affinity. And affinity means um, how much they like something. If I have an affinity for my students, I like that class. If I have less of an affinity or I have more of an affinity for one class over the other, it's because I like one class more than the other, right? So hemoglobin has different affinities when there's a different type of hemoglobin. Affinity to oxygen. It will bind oxygen differently. Now, adult hemoglobin binds oxygen as fine. But fetal hemoglobin will bind it, bind that oxygen at a much stronger affinity or have a much stronger strength than the adult hemoglobin, right? And we'll have a chat about why that is soon. Myoglobin is the kind of, uh, it's a kind of oxygen grabber that is associated with muscles, right? And muscles have an even higher need for uh, oxygen than, say, the fetus or the adult. So these are called oxygen dissociation curve, or hemoglobin dissociation curve, sorry. So as the oxygen content gets greater and greater, then the percentage oxygen saturation, so how much oxygen the hemoglobin is actually holding on to, will change. So you can see this adult hemoglobin one here. As the oxygen becomes greater in the atmosphere there, then it's going to increase and eventually will flatten out. But have a look at this fetal one. Even at a lower at a lower oxygen saturation, it has a substantially higher percentage, sorry, at a lower amount of oxygen present, it has a higher saturation of oxygen, which means it will grab onto any oxygen it can and keep that at a stronger affinity. It will hold onto it in a stronger way than, say, adult hemoglobin. Here's a nice little graph of the same thing at adult hemoglobin, the amount of oxygen available in the system and how much oxygen is going to be available by, uh, to be bound there. Look at myoglobin's curve there. It is grabbing on at such a higher rate than the adult hemoglobin. It will grab even more oxygen in the system than the adult hemoglobin. So even though adult hemoglobin is very effective 
Myoglobin and fetal hemoglobin are much more effective at grabbing, binding, and keeping oxygen in that system. If we have a look at all of those that are available on the same graph, there is our comparison. As the amount of oxygen increases, the oxygen saturation, or how much oxygen that hemoglobin is holding onto, will increase, but at very different rates. Now, myoglobin will grab onto anything because those muscles need so much energy, and to get that energy, they need to do that cellular respiration. And without oxygen, the cellular respiration is not going to be effective at all, right? The fetal hemoglobin has a still very high affinity for oxygen, less so than myoglobin, but more so than the adult hemoglobin because it's really competing with a mother, right? The fetus is essentially a parasite. It needs to be able to really grip onto any oxygen that's coming across that placental membrane there. Adult hemoglobin, yeah, that's still pretty good, you know. We still have quite high affinity for hemoglobin. But the flip side here is when we start to see other things creeping. Now, if you're a smoker, um, you might start having uh, exposure to all these different types of toxins that can bind onto your hemoglobin and not leave. If they're not leaving, there's no available binding sites for the oxygen to get on, and therefore you are less effective. Okay, and this is that kind of uh, hemoglobin right there. All right, back to base regulation. Your blood has a pH range that's pretty tight. Okay? It's just slightly more basic. It's not sitting directly on that seven, but it is a very small range. Anything outside of that, the blood has to try and buffer that. Right? It has to try and balance that out and that's what this whole thing about homeostasis is it is trying all the time to get back to normal you can see we've got some really uh big issues here even if it gets to a six you can potentially lead to death and the same thing if we just jump up to eight so it has a tiny range that it can move otherwise massive problems start to occur and we call those uh problems acidosis and alkalosis and they come with their own set of challenges you might be talking about um, vomiting and diarrhea to the point of complete exhaustion and dehydration, right? And the changes in the pH will, again, coming back to that hemoglobin, will affect the ability to bind that oxygen and therefore carry it around the system. Hypoxia is considered oxygen deficiency, right? If you go dive down and hold your breath for, for 30 seconds in a pool, you're not going to get hypoxia. You're going to have a little bit of oxygen deficiency, but nothing major. Your body still has quite a bit of oxygen moving around it and your lungs will keep some as well. Um, at 100% oxygen saturation, you're all good, right? But as we start to creep down, we start to lower brain function, right? Eventual death is, is quite serious, obviously. So lots of different things can cause hypoxia. You can have disease preventing your body to use oxygen. So I just talked about smoking and having those chemicals bind to your hemoglobin. That can decrease your ability to use oxygen that's coming into your lungs and it won't be able to be transported around. It can go in, but it can't get to these cells appropriately. Anemia means that you are lower in red blood cells or the hemoglobin in those red blood cells. So that means you don't actually have that carrier protein to do the job of delivery. Heart failure and poor blood circulation, once again, it's all about delivering that oxygen around. High altitude is a bit different, and as you go higher up, above sea level, you're going to get to the point where the satur oh, not saturation, the amount of oxygen available is much, much lower. And therefore, your body is going to have to take lots more breaths to try and get the same amount of oxygen in. So you'll have short, shallow breathing. That's going to lead to your body not effectively using um, oxygen as it, when compared to what it normally would, say, at sea level. Poisoning is very similar in that it prevents the cells from using oxygen. It's binding different chemicals to the hemoglobin leaving no binding sites for the oxygen. So oxygen levels at altitude are very, very different. Down here at sea level, which is essentially where most of this failure is, 100% you're all good, but as soon as you start to climb, little oxygen available, right? That's not very much. A third available, your body is going to be trying really desperately to intake as much as it possibly can. So oxygen altitude levels at Colorado resorts. My brother lives in Colorado. He lives in Denver. And when he moved there, he was quite a fit guy. And he would really struggle. Just walking around town, he said to have to stop and breathe like he was an old person who was really struggling all the time. And he was talking to people and they go, Yeah, we're really high above sea level. This isn't this isn't what you're used to. Um, every single uh, restaurant you sit down, they put a whole lot of water in front of you because they know that your body is struggling. Hemoglobin carries oxygen and carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide is one of those things. So you can also get that from um, 
breathing in carfins, it binds very tightly to that hemoglobin and therefore the oxygen that we've got to can't be carried. So that's the thing I've already mentioned. Right, clotting is a positive feedback loop and the platelets are clumping, sending signals to begin a clotting cascade with all those proteins that are in the blood, right? All those clotting factors will help and assist to do that. So there's a positive feedback loop because once it's started, your body's going to keep wanting to do it over and over again until it has naturally resolved itself. Lots of blood disorders, right? Every kind of cell in our blood will suffer, you know, potential for something to go wrong and therefore there can be bigger flow-on effects from that. So you're talking anemias in your erythrocytes, so problems with your red blood cells and your haemoglobin. You're talking leukemias potentially if you're talking your white blood cells and you're talking thrombocytopenias and things like that if you're talking about your platelets. Anemia is decreased red blood cells or haemoglobin. It's your decreased ability to move that oxygen around. So the change in shape of the red blood cells, the volume, so how much haemoglobin they carry, the number of them, maybe you're, you have that impaired production. You might have haemoglobin that doesn't quite work. So we talk about sickle cell anemia, that's one example of that. And increased destruction. If your body starts to attack them, then we have problems, right? Symptoms of anemia are here, there's heaps of them, generally associated with just feeling generally tired and exhausted. So this is what we'd expect in normal red blood cells. We have all these other options here um, for potential changes. We've seen the sickle cells, right? They have that change protein in them and therefore they're going to have a macroscopic look uh, quite different to their normal biconcave discs or donut shapes. That's a very anemic situation. You can see there's very little haemoglobin sitting in those red blood cells and there's not very many of them either. Same thing here. Lots of different shapes, lots of different sizes and lots of different concentrations of haemoglobin. Leukemias are those white blood cell changes and that might mean an abnormal cell line starts to uh, proliferate or, or mature over and over again. And you're going to see blast cells or those immature blood cells will start to come out of the bone marrow and into the normal blood. You would not expect them usually because they're not ready to come out. But if the bone marrow gets so full, then they start to push them out because there's just simply no room. That means bone pain is also a, a symptom of um, leukemias. So here's what you would not expect to see. These are immature white cells. You can see these don't look like our normal neutrophils. They're not those segmented nu uh, nuclei as we're used to seeing. And you sometimes have a granular situations where there's not as many granules in there as there should be and they don't quite look right. All right, clotting disorders, coagulopathies, coagulopathies. Um, and they can be caused from a number of different things, not usually just the platelets, but often the proteins or the clotting factors in your blood. All right, so that's the end of that.